2063. Sorry about that. Pan-Africanism and the African Agenda 2063. Now it's a broad scope with a lot of things going on. So I'm going to narrow it down and talk about the role of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And it's since its exterior is located in my capital of Accra, I deem it like um, fitting to talk about that. And it also seems to have very, very far reaching economic consequences for the continent. So that is what we'll be addressing today. Now the scope of work is to generally talk about Pan-Africanism in general, and then discuss Agenda 2063, the Africa that we want, narrow it down to the aspirations of the agenda, and then talk about the um, African continental free trade area, the objectives of the free trade area, what it means for the continent, and then some misgivings. I mean, regardless of how good everything is, it has to come with some demerits. So there are some perceived faults and ills associated with the agreements and then in consequence, the free trade area to so we'll briefly discuss them and i also touch up on the um, economic the positive economic impact that is going to have on our continent before we look at the way forward the way forward is my suggestion things that i believe that once implemented can help combat the misgivings or try to um, alter perhaps any ills that might uh, accomplish the accompany the implementation of the agreement and then we conclude and I'll take questions if any. So moving on to the introduction. Um, on this, it's I think it's an it's it's a well known. It's not even a secret. It's well known that Africa is geared towards development. There has been so many calls, so many attempts towards a unified front in terms of economic development, in terms of progress. It is a global movement, and I think the vision of bringing Africa. Africa to power with the international com um, community, helping Africa attain its elevated status. It's what um, the entire scope of Pan-Africanism in the modern sense is about now. Now, this is a global movement with the aim to encourage and strengthen the bonds of solidarity between individuals and groups of African descent. The, the, the goal is that Africa, Africans, regardless of where we are in, um, located, are one people with a common destiny, which is to take our rightful place in the global sphere of things. And if you look at the hierarchy, it seems regardless of the natural resources that we've been blessed with, we are also massively affected by the resource curse. And so other countries which are less endowed than us seems to have overtaken us and in effect overtaken the continent. So um, at the core of Pan-Africanism is the realization that unity is key to development. We can both do well individually. I had one of our lecturers say that regardless of how well you do as an African on the international community, once your country and then the continent as a whole is not developing with you, it is, it's a great achievement, all right, but it is not as fulfilling as having the entire continent move with you, as having us be recognized as a powerhouse that we can and we should be. So realizing Pan-African obje objectives will lead to the power consolidation in Africa. And this is where the roadmap of Africa comes to play. And this roadmap is the Agenda 2063 or the Africa that we want. Okay. Now, Agenda 2063. Okay. okay, yes, thank, thank you so much, Miss um, Gray, Miss Audrey. Yes, at this juncture, I'll just, sorry for the interruption, but I just want to welcome- No worries. <laughs> yes, I just want to welcome our special guest of honor. That's Dr. Nana um, Charles from Cameroon. You know, he's a human rights activist and he's, he's a senior lecturer at the University of Jang in Cameroon. Um, please, Doctor, if you are here with us, can you give us a shout out? Um, before you join us, we're having um, one of our, our dear students and renowned, you know, lawyer to be indeed um, from the Ghana School of Law, you know. So she was presenting on the on today's topic. Actually, she was going to do that together with you. Um, so I'll give you the opportunity to say anything um, that you deem appropriate, okay, with respect to this theme or topic for um, our summit, then we proceed from there. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Doris. Yes. Good morning, sir. Yes, it's a pleasure for me to be part of, of this great event. I'm very delighted. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity that you gave me to, to talk on this wonderful and topical, top, very topical sensitive issues in Africa. 
it's very sensitive pan africanism very sensitive issue that we are we are really facing in africa here uh, there's a lot that we, we, we need to let if once you start talking about africa problems today <laughs> if we, even, even the next one be 100 years <laughs> we are we, we are not going to finish that problem because there's a lot to talk about it there's a lot to talk about it a lot to talk about the issue of I mean, Africa, the state of African continent is very important. A lot, lot of things happen around a lot of things. But the question I, I just want to, to ask here is that why Pan Africanism? That's the issue. Why, why, is, it, why is there the need of Pan Africanism? Hmm? Because if, if, if we look at the goal, the objective of Pan Africanism is the issue of solidarity. African countries should be have solidarity and there should be some unity when it comes to African countries to fight against be independent in, in all the aspects of life. But ever since that we have been talking about Africanism from the old age, can we say that Africa are really independent? <laughs> That's a question we need to ask ourselves. What is the problem with African countries? <laughs> yeah? And if there is a problem, what is the way forward? What can we do to, to try to solve this particular problem? Because it's, it's a great problem. It's, it, I call it more, more than Corona. It's more than a pandemic. It's more than a pandemic. We can have pandemic by disease, but we have pandemic by African names. Hmm? Africa has a lot to go when it comes to issue of independence. But now, the problem now is, what, what is, what is really the problem? Because for you to provide a solution, you must know the problem that we are facing. All right? There's a lot of problems that Africa is facing when it comes to the issue of the African continent. One of the first problems I, I discovered when I went into it, I discovered that the issue, the, as, the aspect of what corruption. Corruption is a fundamental problem in Africa. Most of the African leaders are corrupted and we cannot have unity. We cannot have remain togetherness if this corruption is part of the day. You can think, for example, when somebody takes over power in Africa, a leader, he doesn't think about the general interest. He thinks about his individual interest. He don't care the people who put him there. Hmm? The African people who put him there to be the leader, to lead them, to give them an insight of what they think. But when he goes in there, he starts to start thinking about his individual interest. Now, how can we talk about the issue of, of, of uniformity or the issue of unity? It will be difficult to have issue where, where the corruption is part of the day. Then as, as for what Africa is depending so much on it. Huh? It. They have a problem, they go to and borrow where the debt of Africa country is very, very high. And we cannot have a prospective continent if we continue to dwell on the issue of foreign debt, issue of borrowing. Because you know what? When you borrow money, you become a debtor. Eh? You are a prisoner. And once you become a prisoner, you don't have anything to give out. You always become in bondage. And as far as African countries keep on borrowing from these foreign countries, from this, I can, can I put it, the developed world, they will keep on remaining what prisoners to themselves. And you cannot have a leadership when you are not free. So leadership in Africa is a lot of bondage. They will also have what we call instability. We want change, but we are not stable. Eh? What do we do to have stability in Africa? We, we do little works. Eh? And you have to work is what matters here. When you do little works, you cannot survive to become a good continent. Africa needs to be stable. Stability is what makes a country to grow economically, politically, and socially. So instability in Africa is a serious problem that has caused a lot of disorder in Africa. Then I can talk also issue of accountability, lack of accountability. To who does this leader account? Huh? Do they pay account to do? They don't care about the, the masses. They have to give accountability to how they are doing things. That is what we need issue. That's what we need to do. We need accountability 
in what we are doing. Most African leaders, they lack that aspect. They don't give accountability. So it, it will be difficult for us to achieve a good future, a good stable, stable continent in Africa if the African leaders are not accountable to that subject, okay? Then there's also what, there's also what lack of infrastructures. There are so many of the there. food insecurity. So all of these problems is a serious issue, health issue. So a lot of things are on the African continent. And we are talking about 2063. It means in, in about 40 years to come. Eh? Are you getting what I'm saying here? Hmm? Yes. There's a serious problem here. Hmm? If I, I, I discovered that I, had, I have a recession there, that by 2050, the United Nations say by 2050, the population of Africa will be grow to 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion. We are expecting 1.3 billion increase in population by 2050. <laughs> eh? So we can imagine what can happen by 2050 if the resources are not there. If the resources are damaged, the consumer protection will increase. The consumer rate will increase. People demands will increase. Infrastructure base will increase. Energy will increase. Security will increase then we are not able to give a good security to mm, Africa. Mm. That is terrible. Mm. It will be zero, zero terrible there. But now the problem is we have discovered this problem. What should be done? What do we need to do to try to remedy the situation at hand? The first thing I, would, I want to talk about here, if we want the Pan-Africanism to really succeed, if we, have a, we want a good African continent to really be on the base, my brothers and sisters, the first thing is vision. We must have vision. They say without vision, people perish. What is the vision of Africa? What are they looking at the future? What is the future holding for Africa continent? The vision is what is important. Without vision, we are empty. We need to have a vision, a positive vision that we want to grow. We want the economic, economic situation to grow in our continent. The African population. The society, they should have a vision, not a dream. Because the dreams mm. die. Mm. The vision is always an aspect that can lead people to a good destination. The first is the vision. Second, we need leadership. Leadership is still a problem here. Mm? The way leaders are ruling Africa, well, I'm not sure that by 2063, we are going to have a good continent in Africa. If the way we continue that, that people think all about themselves, Leaders don't care about the interest of the people, then I think that there's something should be wrong somewhere. If there's a good leadership, people think about the interest of the population, then we are going to have a wonderful African continent. So leadership should be revisited if you want to go very far in the African continent. Do you have the issue of culture, African culture? Hmm? Our outlook, our belief, it should represent who we are. Let us stop, stop copying people, people culture. Eh? Africa wants to look like Europe. Africa wants to look at America. No, we have our identity. We have our beliefs. We have our culture. Let us trust in our culture. They will be honest. There should be honesty. There should be account. There should be transparency in our culture. If we live on our culture, we are going to have a good African continent. We want to assimilate what is happening in Europe. You want to assimilate what happened in America? No. Africans should remain Africa. Africans should remain, their culture should remain, their culture they should believe in themselves. They should develop their culture in, on trust, on transparency, on honesty, on hard work, on integrity, on collaboration among themselves. If they want, really want to go on, on the good aspect issue here. Then another issue one is institutions. Put in place good institution that is going to harmonize or enforce the laws, enforce the action that are put in place. Without institution, we are not, we have to manage it in such a way that we are going to have strong policies management. And the last one I'm talking about here is what? Action, think and plan. Without action, we perish. A vision without action is no vision. A plan without action is no plan. We have to implement what we are facing here most in Africa is aspect of implementation, aspect of enforcement. We don't enforce laws. We don't enforce policy. The rule of law has no place in Africa. We have good dreams. 
good visions, good goals, good objective, good things, good I mean, I mean, objective of objective in Africa. The how can we attain this objective if we cannot implement the objectives? Eh? Implementation should be our our bedrock, our fundamental aspect here if we want to have a good African continent. Eh? Europe is exceeding very well. America is good. France is good. All those countries are good because of their implementation policy. They go into action. They don't just talk. They, they talk and they act. We are based in Africa more on talking. We just talk and talk and talk. We don't have good account or, or action plan. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to say that there's a lot that we need to do when it comes to issue of Pan-Africanism. 2063 is not far, 40 years from now. Uh -huh. We need, mm, if we want to get this, our culture need to change, our vision need to change, our leadership need to be visited, our plan of action need to go into more enforceability. And with all of this now, we are going to say we have a wonderful African country. It's the best continent in the, in the world. But the most poorest in the world. Huh? Our leaders fought for it. Kwame Krumah, all the ready fought for Africanism. But we have to go back there and see how we go about it. So I just believe. That. That if we really I'm hello, Doc. Yes. Okay, please. Um, you aren't audible. I think you are now audible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're getting. We're getting. Yeah, please. We didn't get um, your last comment. No, I, I, what I'm saying is that we all what we have said here. Okay. If we really put all of this into practice, all of it into, into enforcement, then we are going to be proud to have a good African continent that everybody will want to see it grow. And we all of us have a duty to develop Africa. All of us, nobody should be left behind. Africa is for everybody. Africa is not for Cameroon, it's not for Nigeria, it's not for, for Ghana, it's not for Chad. No, Africa is for everybody. And each one of us have a responsibility to contribute to the development of Africa. And I believe if all of us come together, we are going to have a good African continent. Eh? Unless they abandon what I have said here, those things that it's, it's a problem because the problem is already there, all right? But we have to look for a solution to that problem. And until we look for a solution to that problem now, we are not going to have a problem there. Mm -hmm. So the essence here is to look for the problem there. All these regional grouping, ECOWAS, ECAS, SEMAC, all of them, they should come together and know that it is now time for Africa to have a global mm -hmm. movement here. So I believe that something can be done somewhere. Okay. okay. That's what I believe about it. Wow. Well, wow. that was a very insightful um, thought from our dear doctor all the way from Cameroon. Uh, I've really learned a lot in this wonderful presentation so far as our special guest of honor. Um, doctor, please, I would like to reserve my questions when um, um, our presenter also, our second presenter for today is done with a presentation. That's Ms. Audrey Hanata from Ghana School of Law and um, our South Country Ambassador. Um, I wish to ask those questions after she's done with her presentation. Um, I hope that is okay. okay, Doc. That's okay, it's all right, it's okay, Doc. All right, all right. So thank you so much for your time. I don't know if any other person has any question to ask, but I would like to reserve mine um, from our dear um, participant. Okay, okay. Then, in the absence of any questions, I hope you're also reserving yours for the last for the last minute. So, Miss Audrey, please can you proceed with your presentation now that Doctor is done with his part? 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward for him to answering my questions. Yeah, thank you. Miss Audrey? Thank you very much, James. And thank you so much, Doug. That was a very insightful and extremely passionate presentation. I, I think I read somewhere, I don't know where to credit the source, but then someone said the heart of the African problem is the African heart. And you rightly put it, our leaders, corruption, non-accountability, this is what is running us down. And of course, we, like, we need change and we need radical change. So thank you for bringing that into the limelight. And as you said earlier, we need to have our own framework and of action and then quit copying America and Europe as well. And that is what brings me to um, my what I've, where I've gotten to on my presentation, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. So this is the vision, the prevailing collective vision now for Africa, which hopefully will be devoid of any Western influences and just focus on us as Africans and our path towards development and hopefully world dominance. So Agenda 2063 is the map to the envisioned destiny and our promised land of better conditions on the continent. It is basically the, um, sorry, just a, thank you, James. It is basically the blueprint and master plan of transformation. It is very, it is much seep in um, Pan-African essence of unity, self-determination, freedom, progress, and collective prosperity. Now, this agenda um, of the Africa we want emerged from the realization that there was a need for more because initially all attempts of maybe development or any collective action in Africa was geared towards liberation. That was during the fight for independence and even before that, the fight against apartheid system in South Africa and others. But up, there was very little success when it came to economic and socially progressive endeavors. There was much um, attempts to try and perhaps unify the resources, utilize them together and I don't know, push for all of all the nations to move forward in the development sphere, but there was little success. And I feel um, in this present day and age, our leaders have realized, well, most of them have realized that now more than ever is the time to reprioritize and advocate for continental integration and reposition Africa on the international arena. Now um, at the 50th anniversary, at the 50th anniversary of the Organization of African Unity, that was where the African heads of state signed the 50th anniversary Solomon Declaration. And this is what has evolved and developed into the agenda 2063 that we know now. This is commitment on the part of African leaders towards the rededication to that Pan-African vision, the vision that we can develop only, the vision that we can develop only if we work together. And it is solid proof that Africa needs unity to progress collectively and that this unity and this drive for development must be spearheaded by our own citizens, not by looking at any model in America or any model in Europe as Doc has um, aforementioned. So he too, and I'm also putting here that this agenda 2063 is not the only attempt at maybe um, creating a developmental framework for Africa. Others have other attempts have been made, but what distinguishes this effort from what has already been done is the fact that um, it identifies programs that can boost the economic power of the continent by consolidating the strengths of all nations, and this we hope will lead to rapid development. Now, these programs are simplified into seven aspirations with a set of goals to ease the actualization of these um, aspirations. And I will just um, briefly touch on the seven main aspirations. Um, James, I'm having difficulty seeing the screen. Oh, let me see. Um, okay, I'm it's coming. better now. Wait, wait a while. Um. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I'm just coming. Um, James, let's try to project it as it was initially. I'll look at it on my phone from now. Sure, I'm doing that. I was trying to follow it on the laptop, yes, I'll just do it from here. I think it's okay now. Yes, thank you. 
So the first aspiration is a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Now, under this, the goals here is to raise the high standard of living and well-being for all. This is like an all hands on deck approach. We are not leaving anyone behind this time. So we are looking to transform the collective economies across the continent, not just maybe few countries gaining economic independence and prosperity and others still lacking behind and being examples when we are mentioning the poorest in the world like that's not what we want we want to move forward together and moving forward together we are also going to pay close attention to environmentally stable climate climates and resilient economies and communities you know africa is like home to most of the world's natural resources and now with the whole and um, climate change just a second All right, thank you. So with climate change and its attendance effects, we don't want to progress and then be um, crippled with such consequences. So um, we, there will be close um, monitoring of climatic, um, sorry, environmentally stable climatic um, changes and other developments to ensure that as we are progressing, we are not being, we are not moving forward one step and then taking three steps backwards. The second aspiration is an integrated continent, politically united and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of African Renaissance. Now, the United Africa is not a new um, idea. It has been, the move for a United Africa has been preached by the Pan-Africans of old, Kwame Nkrumah, Gaddafi. We, we had, this idea has always been there. But then hopefully Agenda 2063 is a push to accelerate progress and with respect to that. And most importantly, achieve economic integration and through the um, continental free trade area. We are also looking to have world-class infrastructure in Africa that will link the major cities in Africa. So basically, independent states, but united on one front when it comes to development, united when it comes to the economic um, situations, and united when it comes to general progress, and also giving us a stronger voice and a much united front when it comes to international negotiations. Now, on the second aspiration, which is an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. We can all agree that this is very, very much needed. Like Africa has a tag of people coming into power and refusing to leave only being ousted when, it can, when there's a gun pointed at their faces. This is, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bad reputation, but it is what it is. Recently, we've seen that there's always democratic governments being overthrown. There's always civil unrest somewhere there. And then wherever there are civil unrest, it's accompanied by human rights violations, rule of law is overthrown, and then not, nothing appears to work. So aspiration three of the agenda 2063 is to ensure that Africa is an Africa of good governance. It's an Africa where democracy is respected. It's an Africa where the citizens are given the basic rights of afforded to every human being. And not this is not just on paper, but then there are conscious efforts to ensure that these rights are actually um, enforced. And once violated, the person can seek redress. And um, aspiration four is a peaceful and secure Africa. This links to aspiration three. Once we are able to achieve good governance, once there's democracy, once principles of the rule of law are working, then there will be peace. Civil unrest and political overthrows draw back the economy of a country. Once a country makes progress and then there's um, a coup d'etat or there's um, a civil war breaks out, investors are scared. People are scared to invest their money in such volatile conditions. So achieving aspiration three will guarantee aspiration four. And with aspiration five, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. I think this is what Doc spoke about. Africa is rich, not just in natural resources, but in our culture and our values as well, in our, how we perceive ourselves as a group of people in this world, and how we see that perception in, other, in the way others see us as well. Sadly, it seems most Africans have lost their identity. For me personally, it really saddens me if you see, like, an African who is doing brilliantly on the world market. And then before you realize the person is affiliated to an European country or something, the person is not like, I mean, we are black, but then they are not African. They are from this country instead of like an African country where their roots are from. It doesn't bode well for anyone. So this um, aspiration will focus not just on our cultural identity, but also on how we are being portrayed in the, in the media. More often than not, if you look at all these like really um, successful Hollywood movies, not all, some of them. Africa is portrayed as this like war-torn area where peace, they're always sending peacekeeping 
um, soldiers of peace keeping to come and ensure that we keep the peace. Meanwhile, there's like a vibrant culture that can be portrayed through the um, creative arts industry. I learned recently there's a movie on Netflix, Amina. It's an Nigerian movie about one of the ancient um, queens of Africa. Brilliant movie. This this shows the culture, the resilience of the continent, the strength that we have, not just now men, but in our women as well. But sadly, you don't see that a lot on the international front. We're always being depicted as war-torn areas and dying of poverty and starvation. So hopefully with this aspiration, the creative media can step up and show another side of Africa that the world is not perhaps aware of yet. The sister aspiration is an Africa where development is people-driven, unleashing the potential of its women and youth. So I feel most importantly, women are being accorded the necessary recognition in this um, sense. Most African women are drivers of the economy. In most countries, the market women, the traders, those who are going back and forth, buying, they're selling, that they contribute, they, they, they are the driving force, but then they are mostly overlooked. They end up getting the shorter end of the stick. They end up having to do with um, a lot of discrimination just because of the agenda. And even worse is when gender-based violence sets in. Now, this aspiration is to ensure that rules are set in place in the African countries, part of the... Um, agreement and the agenda and ensure said this is an Africa that we are building for ourselves so people driven Africa not an Africa that we are modeling after another people another um, group of persons and uh, maybe try and error that has worked for them and the last aspiration is Africa as a strong united influential global player and partner agenda 2063 seeks to bring us all together as one so that on the international negotiation platform, all of Africa's resources are combined into one. So we present a unified front when it comes to um, trying to get what we want. And that this will bode well for us because we come, with, we come with more to the table. And if in the absence of corruption and where there's more accountability, it could actually work. We could actually end up getting what we truly deserve instead of being bullied into agreements that does not in your world for anyone's benefit. Presenting a unified front seeks to um, um, bring progress to, I think, everyone involved. And that would be good if we're able to overcome the problems that Doc highlighted earlier on. So next slide, please. Narrowing it down, the, those, the above are the aims of the um, Africa that we want. This is what we seek to achieve. Now I'm going to focus on one aspect, the African continental free trade area. And I feel like the second and the sixth aim involve the active role of this. And as I mentioned earlier, the Secretariat is located in Ghana. And I mean, I was very excited to visit the office. I thought like it, it just, maybe it reignited the Pan-African spirit in me. I was really excited that we are doing something this big for the continent. And then we have the Secretariat located in my country, which will oversee the implementation of this in my view, a great move. So yes, I was excited. And I'm going to share my excitement here by talking about the African Continental Free Trade Area. So this is backed by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And it's like the flagship project of the Africa that we want agenda. It was approved at the 18th ordinary session of Assembly of States, of Heads of States of Government. And this was held in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Now once, um, it's not, I actually started now, it started in January of this year, so it began, trade officially began January 2021. And it is deemed as the largest, as the free trade area with the largest number of participating countries. When everything goes on well, as it should, it's expected to boost the intracontinent trade and ensure that our very much valued resources are put to good use on the continent. It is, it is a, an area that is estimated to cover a market of at least 1.2 billion people and a GDP, a combined GDP of $2.5 trillion. This is no joke. Once we are able to really implement the policies and objectives of this um, agreement, once we are able to push it to the fore, like for it to activate maximum potential, I feel like it will really augur well for everyone on the continent. We will all see positive change in our lives. That is if our leaders do not disappoint. Now, the idea of economic self-standing and efforts to loosen the grip of the West, as Prof. Elia, as Doc earlier on um, emphasized, with Africa going around begging and getting aid and always um, basing our development on aid, this aid does not come without um, conditions. 
this is how we go to um the west we go to the east we borrow money and then it comes with condition we get the shorter end of a stick we get money and then end up depriving our people we get money and then our leaders end up siphoning the funds into their private pockets the ordinary person gets nothing and then the country is just run down and it negatively impacts the continent as a whole so the african free trade area is an effort to loosen such a grip it's an effort to ensure that africa develops internally we mobilize our own resources internally and then we push forward internally without any help or any assistance from anyone that will come with conditions that we will not be able to meet so moving on to the objectives of the um, F AFCFTA, it includes creating a single market for goods and services, as well as facilitating the movement of persons in the bid to strengthen the economic integration of the continent. Most of the time, people say, and um, some people mistakenly deem Africa as one country. Of course, it is not. It's a continent with a lot of countries. But then together, we are stronger. It's what the AF, um, AFCFT is trying to achieve now. Once we have a single market for goods and services, once an African country can trade with another country with lower tariffs and less strenuous conditions, it's, it's a win-win situation for everyone involved in this. You are able to get um, goods and services at cheaper um, rates compared to other countries that are not part of the agreement. And this is boosting your economy and then boosting the economy of the other country who is supplying as well. It also aims to create a liberalized market for goods and services through successive rounds of negotiation. I think I've mentioned that already. And enhance competitiveness of the, economic, of the economies of state parties within the continent and the world market. The agenda is to move together as one. We are not leaving any African country behind. So the um, free trade area boosts competitiveness. If you are not trying hard enough and another country is getting all the benefits, you will know what is going on. You will see the development that is happening. Your entrepreneurs will, will know that they have to up their game. Something needs to be done. And that's what the um, agreement seems to um, awaken, to stir up that spirit in the African country that we cannot remain laid back. There's more to be achieved, there's more to be done. So it will enhance competitiveness. It also aims to resolve challenges of multiple and overlapping memberships and expedite regional and continental integration processes. So as Doc mentioned earlier, most of the time, Africa is all about talk and no action. There are a lot of regional blocks aimed towards economic integration and people question the fact that we already have these blocks. So how different is the um, continental free trade area and agreement going to be? What is it going to do that this block is not already doing and i did search and it seems they've not specifically addressed that but then the, the beacon of hope is that what it will do that is different from what has already been done is the fact that what already exists are regional blocks and sometimes even bilateral agreements between two countries but then this is a more unified front approach as i mentioned earlier a more hands-on deck approach to ensure that we are all moving collectively towards development so it's not regional it's continental everyone is involved once there's agreement and we all sign once they all sign the agreement and ratify it in their various countries it is the entire continent of africa is just a big marketplace and i mean that's an awesome idea to help eradicate poverty will help bring more opportunities. So it's a great step in the right direction. And then finally, it's to lay the foundation for the establishment of a continental customs union at a later stage. We are taking baby steps now, but then it's still progress. They've commenced activities and they've commenced trade in January of this year. And hopefully by two, three years time, we'll see these things actualized. That is if, once again, the problems that Prof highlighted does not come to serve as stumbling blocks in our path. Now, the above um, objectives that I've already enunciated, it's what many want for Africa. No one wants to see Africa at the bottom of the food chains. No one wants to see Africa at the bottom of the food chain. But regardless of the good that will come out of it, like the fact that it presents an opportunity for us to maximize talent on the continent, no more brain drain, no more Africans performing extraordinarily on the world stage. And then when you inquire further, they are not of, from any African countries. They are affiliated with Europe or America. And it's also a, um, a major step towards the eradication of stark poverty. This is, it's, it's like, um, it's widening the scope of opportunities for us as Africans. If your country is too stifling, if there's limited development, if there's limited opportunities for growth, this presents an opportunity for you to move to another place to try your luck out there. Instead of us to move to Europe for greener pastures, move to another country in Africa so that the development stays inside the continent, our resources are used 
in the continent for us our, for our own good. And um, it's also a great push for gender equality in line with the fifth aim. And this is very, very progressive because most of the time, as I mentioned earlier, women contribute to the growth of economies, but then they end up being overlooked. So if this um, agreement comes up with policies that will recognize the role of women and the part that they have played in the economies and then ensure that they get their due, it's a massive step in the right direction. Now, as I said earlier, regardless of the great um, benefit that we, we can achieve and we will achieve, hopefully, from the agreement, it also comes with potential demerits. And one of the key um, demerits of or misgivings that people have with respect to the African continental free trade area and in effect the agreement that establishes it is the fact that it might stifle local entrepreneurs. Now it is it's it's well known that Nigeria was one of Nigeria delayed in ratifying the agreement. And Nigeria is the largest is the country with the largest population in Africa. It's 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 contribute, I think is the second I'm not, okay, I'm not going there because it's, it's an assumption. But then Nigeria has the largest population in Africa with a great economy, a great economy, massive GDP and all that. But then they delayed in ratifying this agreement, an agreement that is going to unify the economy of the entire continent and push us towards development. Nigeria was stalling. And their, their reason was that they do not want to engage in anything that might end up stifling their local entrepreneurs, opening their markets too wide and effects um, perhaps not being in the good interest of their people. And this is what, it's not just Nigeria. I mean, they, 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 they've come around and ratified the agreement, but regardless of that people, a lot of people still have these same misgivings that opening up a market and then turning the whole Africa into one big single market that you can go and come as you please, you have limitless opportunities, will stifle the local entrepreneurs. You'll be in your country and someone will come with better offers and better options. And that might not inure to your benefits. Secondly, is the loss of income taxes. The agreement aims to reduce a lot of tariffs and then remove most of the constraints when it comes to importing goods from other countries that are party to the agreement. People fear that it might lead to loss of income taxes. And then most countries use these taxes to develop. So it's a very viable fear that I'm not sure if um, the government of states parties are taking steps to ensure that the fears are aligned and people will know that there could be, there's more to gain than to lose from joining the AFCFTA. Last demerit is that it might create unfavorable labor conditions. Now, most countries in Africa have generic labor laws. They are parties to various labor conventions internationally, and they incorporate the principles into their labor laws, but they leave the specifics of labor agreements to the employers. So the specifics of an employment contract is subject to the generosity of the employer. So what the employer gives is what the employee receives. And already there are lots of labor unions and trade unions trying to fight for better conditions of service. So if there's a free market where once maybe employees get too loud about their wishes, there are others who are more than willing to do the work and do it well in the same conditions that someone else is complaining, then they, it might stall development when it comes to um, labor laws. It might, it, 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 it creates fear in employees that already favorable, already unfavorable labor conditions will be maintained because there, will, there, are, there are more options available who are willing to continue the work in the conditions that you are complaining about. So these are the misgivings that some people have with respect to um, opening up the trade market and then um, uniting the economic front and creating a single market. But, and I might, Perhaps I share with some of the misgivings, but I feel like it is not too late to make amends. We've just started, it's a long way to go. We have um, estimates, like, I think we have 42 something years, the um, actualization of our agenda. So there's more to be done. And I put my thoughts down in the way forward. So this is what I think that once implemented will help us to um, circumvent the misgivings concerning the African continental free trade area and the fears that people have with respect to a single market in Africa. The first one is mass sensitization. I think um, states countries are going around ratifying the agreements and putting nice things on paper that make us look very good, make us look like we are taking progressive steps towards development. But then the citizens in these countries do not really understand what is going on. So people are scared genuinely scared that if I'm in my country and someone can just come in and also bring um, this good that I'm manufacturing, they can also bring the same thing at perhaps even a cheaper price, then that is not going to bode well for me. And that creates fear in um, 
the locals and the government is not done is the governments are not doing enough sensitization to explain to them the agenda to explain to them the path to explain to them the blueprints and what we are doing where we are now and where we seek to go i feel like once people understand that at the heart of every african is to see us progress i don't think any african wants to see us as where we are now an impoverished um, continent lacking basic necessities and always being torn by war we want to see progress. So if this gives us a chance or a shot at that, then we have to take it. But the governments do not explain it enough to the local people. And I'll give a perfect example. So the Secretariat is located in Accra, Ghana. We are expected to know better. I was in public transport one time and then a conversation came up with respect to the free trade area. And already there's legislation in Ghana that prevents foreigners from engaging in retail services. So if you're a foreigner, there's only enough you can do. You can't engage in, you can't buy and sell as a local person. And there are some industries that are specifically restricted and left to Ghanaians alone. But then there are lots of foreigners in this country and most especially Nigerians. And some Nigerians engage in retail businesses. And there has been a lot of clashes in like in the marketplaces. It has been covered by the media. People are angry that Nigerians are taking their jobs and this and that. So this conversation came up in the bus. And then someone mentioned the um, African continental free trade area. And they said, yes, yeah, so we're supposed to make this a very big marketplace. And another person um, expressed an opinion that even without that, look at what they are doing in this country. You can't even get anything to do whatever you want to sell. A foreigner is already selling. If they open up the market, there will be nothing for us to do as Ghanaians at all. They'll come and take everything away. And the, the person put it across in a very scary way. If you're an ordinary person without much knowledge about um, what is happening, with limited idea about Agenda 2063 and what we are aiming towards, you'd be very scared and wonder why on earth our government will go and ratify something like that. And for me, sitting there quietly, I didn't even try to explain because it was going to be a very, very long conversation that I wasn't ready for. So in my heart, I thought, no, we are going about it wrongly. People need to buy into the idea. They need to buy into where we are trying to go, what we are selling, and we are failing to do that. So once there's mass sensitization, most people will understand what is going on and then a lot of the fears will be dispelled. The second one is a constant re-evaluation of policies and implementation. The AFCFTA comes with a lot of policies that um, are geared towards economic integration. So they're not just targeting the markets. They're also targeting even our links, trying to link major cities, trying to make sure that moving resources are going to be easier and others. But I feel that as Doc said, it shouldn't just be on paper. Once we always come up with nice ideas, Africa, we are good at formulating policies, but then we suck when it comes to implementing and enforcing them. And that should not happen with this agreement. This is a blueprint. This is something that we want to happen. And it's something that everyone agrees to be very beneficial once we're able to launch it, once everyone does it, um, his or her part. So I think that what we can do or what the secretaries can do is to constantly reevaluate the policies that they've set up constantly check the rules and then compare it with the practical realities on the ground to ensure that they are not just looking good on paper, but then in reality, goals are being achieved. In reality, people are getting more employment opportunities. In reality, people are getting more avenues for growth, more avenues for development. And then in reality, women are being accorded their due when it comes to economic matters and then the finances. And finally, is the revision of applicable laws in some state parties. So as I mentioned earlier, most people are scared of and the loss of income taxes and other um, tariffs that accompany goods, imported goods. I think what can be done, how we can circumvent this is that the applicable laws in state parties that might be negatively affected by the agreements, so to say, should be revised. We should take people, state countries and governments should be proactive. If it's going to affect your tax laws, if you can't tax this goods, find another way of generating revenue for the country. Secondly, most importantly for me is the labor laws, because most labor laws are already weak as it is. So if you and if there's a free market that gives more avenue and there, there are more people to do the job, it, it, it puts, it worsens an already precarious situation. So I think that we, the state countries need to look at their internal laws as well, and then compare it to how they can best achieve the aims and objectives of the AFCFTA without um, questioning the interests of their citizens or without bringing, um, let's say, misfortune, without chasing advantages and end up bringing misfortune to their local citizens. And these three, in my opinion, once um, 
perhaps considered by the secretariat, we can easily go ahead with our objectives. We can easily go ahead with implementing the AFCFCA, opening up Africa, presenting a unified front, and it will be devoid of any kind of um, disadvantages, and no one will be at an unfair disadvantage compared to another country. Thus, conclusively, I think the AFCFCA, as set up by the agreements, it embodies the Pan African spirit of old. It is what we are doing now is what the those who fought for liberation of Africa thought of. It's what they would have wanted us to do. So if we have started this great step as encapsulated in Agenda 2063 and their reservations, I think that once we look at the way forward, once we look at the things that can be done to alleviate these fears, then we can truly progress. And then Africa will take its place on the world stage as it should. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> wow. wow. Oh, thank, you so thank you so much to Ms. Audrey and Arthur yeah. from Ghana with, Ghana with um, wonderful presentation. So can I, so can end, I end the screen share? screen share? Yes, please, you can. Thank you very much, James. All right. All right. Then we then can, we can help with the questions. questions. Um, um. Okay, so my first question goes to Dr. Um, Dr. Nana, I think um, he's actually not here. Yes, but my first question is, okay, let me, let me post it to Audrey. I think, okay, the doctor is here, the doctor is here. So doctor, um, during your presentation, you made mention of the fact that um, Africa, whenever you made mention of um, Pan-Africanism, it mostly comes with its challenges, and you, you highlighted these challenges and elaborated them, you know, power, seizure of power, those kind of things. But Doc, do you still think that the spread of Pan-Africanism, that um, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, um, um, Thomas Sankara, Julius Nyerere from Tanzania and co, that even led to the division of groups, the Casablanca group and the Morovia group, that um, and later on, which the Moravia group won because DS was to the fact that Pan Africanism we should unite, but it shouldn't be in a hasty manner, um, as opposed to what Dr. Kwame Nkrumah um, and his group had a meeting in Morocco and decided on that we need unity within Africa now. Let's have one currency, let's have one military, let's do everything in common, you know, so that there shouldn't be this kind of division amongst us. Please, pro, um, doctor, do you think that this spirit still exists looking at the various kind of regional um, um, communities that we have, regional groups, for instance, ECOWAS and all those kind of things? Is there any hope going forward that, yes, we are going to attain that aim? Oh, doc. Hello, Doc. Doctor, um, please, am I audible? James, I can hear you. Yes, I hear yes. you. Um, I think, Doc, Doc, please, are you here with us? Okay. Then, Audrey, let me ask. Let me ask the question. This, let me pose this to you. When, when, Doctor. Um, it's audible, I'll, I'll, I'll get my response. So, Miss Audrey, you may mention the fact that um, people need to understand, you know, um, this um, free trade agreement, continental free trade agreement. And dwelling from the question I just asked, Doc, okay, how sure are we that this particular argument that you just take us through is going to suffice? Looking at the various um, 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 regional um, groups that already exist. For instance, ECOWAS, you know, ECOWAS has its own rules, principles and everything. When it comes to the East African community, they also have the, yes, if it, like it cuts across. You, what do you think, how possible is it that this after is going to reconcile with some of these conflicting issues that we have? As we just mentioned that uh, some Ghanaians are saying that foreigners will take over their local businesses. How possible is that? Because this is the first time they're going to have 
an integrated community that at least almost all the African countries have rectified. You talking about Nigeria and South Africa, they were hesitating to ratify or sign the agreement. How possible is it to reconcile with local content? Oh, okay, so um, reconciling the agreement with already existing regional blocks and already existing economic agreements, it, this is an issue that has been raised severally, and it does make sense. If you want um, um, economic integration, if you want to present a unified front, and there's already something like the economic community of West African states and other states also have similar things, and there's no need technically for any free trade area. but what it's what this makes um, what makes it different is that this is unified. This is not just a region. This is the entire continent. And in terms of overlapping membership, the um, AFCFTA provides that where um, there's a provision in the agreement, and then there's also there's also another conflicting provision in any regional agreement or any regional um, policy, and the conditions there are better than what the AFCFTA is. Um, offering, then in that situation, the original one should prevail. But in any other, AFCFTA is supposed to supersede all other agreements. So that's in respect to the overlapping um, question. I don't know if I've answered everything yet. I feel like I haven't. Um, yes, I think this, I've gotten your point this far. Um, please, I'll just have to pause here and give others the opportunity to ask questions. If, if I hope there are a lot of questions that people want to ask. Um, I can see Kennedy muting or muting. Please, do you have anything to say? Kennedy, do you have a question? Uh, okay, I think mine is just a contribution. <clears throat> okay. Uh, am well, I audible? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, it's sure. just a contribution and also as regards the question that you were earlier trying to post to Dr. Nana. I think uh, the spirit that our forefathers had to unite Africa and to see that the Africa Agenda six, uh, 2063 comes to pass uh, is still within uh, here in Africa, though it will take all of us to come together and uh, make sure that we try to implement the things that our forefathers foresaw, because uh, when you look at Africa today, there are a lot of leaders that have got uh, great leadership skills and they are willing to share with other willing African leaders. But the thing is that uh, uh, why these things are not yet being implemented is due to the fact that there is too much uh, dependence syndrome in the African leaders, because uh, from the time we are being partitioned from the European uh, unions and I mean, uh, European unions, yes, and also the colonial masters, uh, we are still dependent on the things that they left us with. When you look at most of our African constitutions are still uh, depicting their origins from colonial masters, so as such, it will be very difficult for uh, us as Africans to achieve the Africa Agenda 2063. But it is not impossible. It is just difficult, but not impossible. It is possible due to the fact that if we all come together as the Africans and put our heads together, we can be able to achieve this. And how do we achieve this? Through such meetings that we are holding. Um, I was just going through the, 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 the membership uh, from all these groups that this uh, program was posted on, there are a lot of us in those groups. And yet I can see at the moment, we are just 11 attending this meeting, which makes it so uh, a little bit difficult for us to achieve. But if we are all to come up with the same ideologies, think in like manner and be able to implement all these and come up with proactive policies that will aim at curbing problems before we face them, then as Africans, we'll be able to achieve the visions that our forefathers had before attaining independence, because they never attained independence before thinking of what will be of Africa and the, its respective nations before independence was attained. And as such, they made sure that 
uh, they had the vision and they put up action plans as to why they will be able to establish independence, uh, independent states rather in Africa. So therefore, if we come together, we have the spirit of oneness, we educate ourselves on how best we can curb corruption, on how best we can uh, curb nepotism, and on how best we can be able to put leaders that are able to deliver to the best uh, in their respective uh, states, then by so doing, we'll have an African continent that will be able to participate in the international trade, the African continent that will allow free uh, trade areas among African states, the African continent that will not have the issue of xenophobic activities that are taking place. That is, if only we get to unite and put our heads together. Of course, it is not everyone who will be of the agenda, but if a few individuals like we are coming up now are able to put our heads together and bring up solutions that will solve African problems, then that way we'll be able to achieve what we need by uh, the year 1963 as stipulated in the agenda 2063. I mean, not 1963, but 2063 as stipulated in the agenda 2063 as visioned by the forefathers such as Kwame Nkrumah and the other uh, icons of Africa that fought for the well-being of Africa. I think that's how far I can go, I submit. Okay, thank you so much, um, Kennedy. That was a very wonderful one there. Um, please, um, if you have any question to ask, you can omit yourself and ask your question. Um, contribution, questions, or any other thing that you deem appropriate. Um, Doc, please, are you, are you still here with us? Doc. Um, okay, please, do any of you have any questions? So far, am I audible? Yes, please, you are. Okay, thank you so much. Um, forgive me, my voice is quite hoarse, uh, not too well. All right, I wanted to direct a question to Council Audrey. And by the way, I want to appreciate that was a very powerful presentation. And it brought out a lot of, um, you know, outstanding aspects in our quest to attain Pan-Africanism. Now, my question is um, directed to her, especially when she mentioned how the Western world portrays Africa, especially in the artistic uh, industry or in the art industry in the movie industry, in the way we are portrayed generally by the Western world, for lack of a better term. I wanted to find out, yeah, how do you think, or what are some of the ways in which you think we could rebrand ourselves as a continent in order that the Western world views us as we are as a continent? I don't know if you get my question in my view. How best would you love us to be rebranded or what are some of the measures that you feel the continent should be able to take in order for us to delete that view that the Western world has towards us? The second question and my last is directed to Doc and uh, uh, it, 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 I, I really feel that the answer has not really been exhausted, especially on the question that was earlier asked. I feel in the fight or in the quest for us to achieve Pan-Africanism, we have to aim for collective action and everyone, every state that is in Africa should obviously consent to this view. Do you feel that we are on the quest to achieve Pan-Africanism or we are still lagging behind? Because I feel this topic has not been widely discussed as it should be. And I feel that not everyone understands it. And not the, the, the layman 
who is walking in the street cannot understand what we mean by Africanism. So do you think we are propelling in the direction where even a grandmother in the village would be able to understand our fight and our quest towards Pan-Africanism? I submit. Thank you so much. That was a very wonderful question. Um, Ms. Audrey, please. Um, hi, thank you very much for the um, question. So I'll try to be very, very brief with my answer. So with respect to how we can get the West viewers differently, especially in the creative arts industry. First of all, I feel like the creative arts industries in the various African countries must be adequately empowered. In Ghana here, we have the Creative Arts Industry um, Act that has been recently passed and it's aiming to give them more creative license, provide avenues for support. If you have a brilliant idea, you can get the adequate support you need so that you get to show us a brighter version of ourselves. I feel like when this, if this is implemented in other countries, it will just go a really, really long way. Most, um, apart from the laws to empower the creative industries, there should also be laws to carefully streamline our content. This is how most of the time on, even in Africa here on our TV stations, we are not watching our own contents. We are watching contents from the US and most recently India. Indian movies are everywhere. We are not watching our own content. Our own content. So producers are, are less inclined to come out with something that is like really, really top-notch quality that people would want to watch. I feel there's enough. People are really, really lax when it comes to um, these things, our production. So once there are laws to enable the creative arts industry, better content to be put out and then perhaps that would spike the interest in the African in our own continent and ultimately reach the foreigners. And this will this translates into my second point of showing them how we want them to see us. Once we have great content, now it's, it's a global world. This is how you have shows from um, countries that you would ordinarily not see anything from them but we have it on netflix and other streaming platforms and it reaches a much much larger audience so if we have quality production that is available to such an audience gradually the perception about africa will change thirdly we need to take initiative we can't have others telling us our story if african creatives are taking the initiative and then coming up with our stories our own stories in the form of movies or series and once again i'll use the i mean our example Personally, I've not watched the movie. I watched the trailer and I read the reviews and I was impressed with the trailer. It's not, it's, it's a trailer that was not about a child with a gun in their hand or a child who, so, who has been stabbed, malnourished, about to die or anything. Sad. It was about empowerment, about how Africa used to be, our roots. And I thought this, this is great for kids to watch and then see how far we've come as a continent. It's also great for other people to also see and know that Africa is not just about um, skinny, malnourished kids and child soldiers and death and corruption. There's more that Africa has to offer. And once again, focusing on that does not mean, of course, we are denying the realities of war on the continent. No, we are not. We are showing them something different, showing that Africa is not all about guns and death and hunger. There's more to be shown in Africa. There's a rich culture here. Finally, we need to learn our history. I think people in the creative arts industries, most of them don't even know the rich culture of Africa. You see so much movies about like the Great Wall of China and how amazing it is. Meanwhile, I recently discovered or learned that there's a Great Wall of Benin and it's even, I don't know if it's three times or five times longer or more it's more impressive than the great wall of china but no one hears about that we place emphasis on the greatness of other countries and then we relieve ours and it's because we don't know our history we don't know how far we've come we have no idea the great kings and queens and the great kingdoms that existed on the african continent there's so much learning to be done so i feel like once there's um, legislations to back the creative arts industry there's funding available we take initiatives to make our own movies and tell our own stories we show them how we want to be seen and then we learn our um, our, our history and then portray it in our movies gradually the perception about africa on the international forum will change thank you Thank you very much. Um, that was a very wonderful response there for Ms. Audrey. Um, please, are you satisfied with the answer, Maseka? Yes. I guess she, because she, she really, she really 
made it clear. Yes. Ye yes, I'm definitely satisfied. Yes. Okay. Um. Please, I'm trying. Doc, please, are you here with us, Doc? Um. Okay. Um. Pascal, you raise your hand, please. Do you have a question? Sorry, am I audible, please? You're, you're audible, but please can you raise your voice a little bit? Okay, sir. Oh, I, I do have a question just. It was a, in addition to the question that has been directed to Miss Oden. Oh, I will be answering this question in two aspects. Although we have many actions that we can take to change how the wise treat us, but I will be answering this question with two aspects. Just the first thing that I have to mention here is the, uh, the, to obey the rule of law. In fact, uh, our constitutions all of us African countries are well, well scripted. But the issue that we have is that we do not obey the provisions that are stated in these constitutions. We see sometimes our constitutions are there written and well written, but one, one reader once his thumb is about to be terminated, he pretend uh, for the purpose of democracy, for the purpose of interest of the uh, population, he pretend to change the constitution. What is that? I strongly suggest that African countries mostly, uh, especially African leaders, should obey the rule of law. It's just where we reach and uh, be able to confirm that we are stable in our minds, we are suitable in our actions, we are stable and we, are, uh, we can grab the opportunities that we have because uh, the mindset that we have is just, if I can say so, I'm, and I'm very sorry to, to say like this, we have greedy mindset that everyone is fighting for his or her own interest. This should be changed for it. Uh, again, the other point that I want to raise by the, the, the actions that we can do in Africa just to uh, to show the whites that we are different from what they think is that uh, we have just to, to, to develop the issue of homegrown solution. Uh, the issue of homegrown solution is the most important practical aspect that you have to develop to show that we are capable, we think, we act, we, we just, we are strong in the mind. Without homegrown solution aspect in Africa, we are nothing. They will continue to treat us like babies, huh? <laughs> like, like incapable person. We have to develop the aspect of homegrown solution. Uh, I can just uh, justify this by highlighting the key aspects or scope of this idea. For sure, in Africa, we have many natural resources, but what is the use of natural resources that we have? Uh, I, I can highlight some countries that have gases, that have minerals, but they do not have uh, industries to manufacture any material from those natural resources. Is that functional? 
We should consider this and reconsider anyway. Thank you. Okay. Yes, that was a very um um wonderful submissions there from our brother. Hello. Yes, Hello. Doc. Yes, dog. Please, you are welcome back. Yes. <laughs> Hello, dog. Sorry, I was I was doing something for 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 that. Yes, I'm getting. I'm getting. Yes, yes, please. We we have we have a bunch of questions for you, dog. Um, but please, Mas Masaka, you ask a question that was yeah. that was based on um consent from African leaders. Uh, can, please, can, you, can you please rephrase that question for Doc to answer? Okay, thank you so much. Actually, it is also nice that you, the Doc is back so that I can combine it with another last question. Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to be allowed, moderator. Please go ahead, yeah. All right, so, um, Doctor, my question was, uh, Pan-Africanism can only be achieved if at all we have collective effort from all the African states combined. Yeah. Now, my question is, do you feel that we can achieve that? Um, do you feel that our leaders could really tune into the idea of Pan-Africanism? And do you feel we are sailing in that direction as the continent? And also, I asked the question that do you feel that we are doing enough to get the idea and the principles of Pan-Africanism to a layman's language, to a layman? For example, a woman who is in the village who wouldn't understand this concept. Do you feel we are doing enough to get them to know that we uh, to get them to know the principles and uh, the ethics that govern Pan-Africanism. The last question, Doctor, before you answer is, uh, uh, I realize that as an, a continent, we depend so much on the European. You know, you realize that for tickets of mining of copper, gold, diamonds, in most of the African states, you discover that... Uh, we, most of the African states don't even own their own mines. Most of the African states don't even own their own land. And so do you feel that the principle of Africanism or, Af or Pan-Africanism can be achieved if at all we still depend on the Western to uh, fund our economies and our budgets? Thank you so much. I submit. Okay. Thank you so much, my brother, for that wonderful question you just posed now. Let me start with the first question. There is, there is an objective for Pan-Africanism. There is a line that cuts across Pan-Africanism. There is a main aspect of Pan-Africanism, which is solidarity and unity. That is the main aspect of Pan-Africanism. Everybody, what, what, what you talk about is to somebody, what comes to somebody's mind? It's unity, African coming together, having a common objective, a common goal, a common vision, a common aspect of life. That is, that is the raison d'etre of Pan-Africanism we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. But now, if we cannot have that common goal, if we cannot have that common vision, if we cannot have that common leadership, if we cannot have that common plan, plan of action, then we are saying that the issue of Pan-Africanism is still a far fetch. It's still a nightmare. It's still a what? I can say that it's still is not a reality. We still have a long way to go there. Hmm? We are not saying this as this aspect are there. They are there. Some African they have vision. It's good, but now we need to reinforce this vision to be able to meet up with the objective of Pan-Africanism. Okay, that's what we are talking about here. It's high time African leaders know that what is their acts, they say, what are my visions? Why should I be, 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 be backward all the time? Why am I not developing? Why am I not progressing? Why am I not functioning economically? When you ask yourself, you will know that there's a problem wrong somewhere. And you know that when you are single in life, when you are alone, you cannot achieve anything in life. 
But when you are together, when you have a joint effort, it's some way that you can achieve and go a very long way. So together is strength. That's what we need to understand here. Now, we also have to, we are not saying that we cannot copy from the white man. No, I refuse that. The white man, they have like, it's just like a model. Africa should look the white man Look, the white man was planting, transplanting. Okay, we are not refusing. The culture are good. The African need to do one to try to copy in a positive manner, not in the negative manner, that can affect their initial culture, their initial identity. There is no way African can be like white. No way. You are a black. You can never change to a white color. Never. You respect your identity, and you see how you can develop. The white man ways or the Western world's way should be like a wall, like a pivot. It should be like an, a mirror where Africa is going to use it to be able to, to, what, to diagnose it into the African continent so they're going to have a better African development. All right? So those are my, my ways I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. So we need to know about the essence of Afghan Africanism and to see about the positive side of the culture of Africa. Thank you about that. Hello? Yes, Doc. I hope I've answered the question. Together. Yes, thank you so much, Doc, for that wonderful response. Um, and my question that I posed earlier on, I think is more related to what my, my dear brother just asked. It, is, it was in relation to the fact that, Doc, do you foresee Africa becoming united as a United Nations or United State of Africa that the Kwame Krumers, the Julius Sinereres of Tanzania, as they had proud to most of the independence, uh, um, proud to independence, most of African independence, because that even led to the Casablanca and the Morovia groups and all those kind of things. Do you still for, for, foresee that spread of Pan-Africanism that is going to happen anytime soon? Because each state, African state, try to be as much as possible, you know, try to show that they have the power, they have everything and they can do anything. And that is why if you have to travel from one African country to the other, you have to change currency, you know, 54 African countries or 55, we all have different currencies, you know, and that is a very huge problem. Do you foresee a day that, and how soon that a day is coming that Africans will say, African states or the heads of, um, leaders of Africa say that let's, let's come together and have one currency. Let's come together and have one government and decentralize it to different states. Prof, thank you. Yes, there, 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 is, there, is, there are so much possibilities, Papa. Where there is a will, where there is a way, there is a will. If we have the way, we have the willpower, African can see me of those dreams. As I said in the beginning, there are some things that Africa need to know if they really want to and they really want to achieve the essence of their, their identity. If they have the right vision, do we have the same vision? Do we have the same leadership aspect here? Do we have the same culture? Do we have the same instruction put in place? Do we have the same plan of action? We must have a vision. We must have an, a leadership, quality leadership aspect. We must have a good culture which we are going to establish it for a good African continent. We will have a solid, a strong institution put in place. The parliament already must be strong institution put in place. We will also have one, action, we must plan, we must think, we must act to put in place here. So if African leaders can come with these five aspects here, bring these five aspects together, then we can still dream that the, the, the issue of Martin Luther King is not still false, that we have to dream. Africa still have a dream, but these dreams cannot be realized if Africans don't put the dreams into action. Coming together is to be the strength of Africa. And I, and I, I, I believe that it will put away our pride away, put away our egoistic, 
with our self-centeredness, with our corruptive practices, and say, let us build a wonderful Africa. Let us build a prospective Africa, a few Africa future that will be solid, a foundation Africa. We are going to achieve these goals. And we can do that. It's just that Africa does not want to grow. You want to remain children. And once you remain a child, you can never be mature enough. Africa learn, love to start learning how to be mature. It's gone at those days that Africa is a, it's a child. Africa has to be mature and think about their problems mm? and try to see the way forward about their various problems. Mm? Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much, Doctor. I'm very well pleased with your response. Um, and I don't have any further questions to ask as, as, at this time. Yes. Please, if you have any question, you raise your hand, then um, we bring the program to an end. Any questions? Contributions? Um, yes, from the beginning of the program, we have a lot of participants, um, and then people start dropping. I think these are some of the challenges that Africa we need to come together to work on. We have, we sometimes we don't have good internet connections, you know, and, and, and all those kinds of things. You have to live up to date. Um, so in the absence of that, Doc, I would like to um, crave your indulgence and on behalf of African Law Student Association um, to thank you and everyone, you, Maseka, Pascal, um, um, lawyer Charles and lawyer Audrey from Ghana and our dear friend and brother Esquire too from, uh, I don't know where he's from, but he's joined us for some time now, James. You know my name, yes. Thank you so much for joining. Um, you're so much glad. This is just day one of the submits. Um, you are continuing. I'm going to continue to come your way for the th remaining three days. You know, um, 8:30 GMT and 10:30 Central Africa time, and um, in, in that way. So thank you so much for for joining today's section. And God bless you all. Have a wonderful day, morning, or evening, or afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye.